What happens in the spirit realm when you reject Christ? This message is weighing heavy on my heart today. It is weighing heavy in my spirit today because so many people are lost and they don't even realize it. Brothers and sisters, church attendance is not salvation. Listening to a Christian video is not salvation. Saying a prayer one time in your life because you were scared to go to hell is not salvation. Wearing a necklace of a cross is not salvation. Salvation, as the term implies, is being rescued from hell, but also from sin itself, its power and ultimately its very presence. Do you understand the lengths that Jesus had to go for you to be saved? Do you understand that through Christ being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation? Do you understand that Christ took it upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men? Do you understand that Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? Do you understand the lengths that Jesus Christ had to go to ensure that you do not end up in hell? Anyone who hears the preaching of the gospel but refuses to accept Christ, their heart gets a little hard to the gospel. There are people who come to church but refuse to change when the Word of God addresses them. Instead of showing remorse for their sins, they harden their hearts against the hammer of God's Word. They go to church. The pastor preaches about their sin, the sin that they committed last night or a few hours ago. But rather than repenting, rather than being remorseful for their sin, they harden their heart to the world of God. The more you reject Christ and the more you reject the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life, the more hardened you get. Your heart becomes like stone. Honesty is the first step to repentance. If you know you have a problem with sin, I'm not even saying go to a minister, go to your husband or wife or anyone to share your problem. I'm saying today, be honest with yourself and accept you have a problem and humble yourself before the Lord. God will create in you a clean heart. Look at David in Psalm 51. The historical background goes as following. 2 Samuel 11:12. David, while his armies were battling the Ammonites, was in residence in Jerusalem, and he saw Bathsheba, the wife of one of his military generals, bathing on her rooftop. He sends for her, commits adultery with her, and then conspires to have her husband, Uriah, killed in battle. When Nathan confronts David with the implications of what he has done, David's only words are striking. He made no mention of anyone else. His one and only concern was the Lord. 2 Samuel 12. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Your concern today should be with the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Cry out to him. So, in summary, David had sinned in murder, in adultery, in covering his sin, and in hardness against repentance. Let's begin the chapter. Psalm 51, 1 through 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Look at David's choice of words according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. God is abundant in loving kindness and abundant in tender mercies. Our God is a God of forgiveness. Our God is a God full of loving kindness. And that is something you should remember. God will not hold your sins against you. God is not a man. Once God forgives you, he will forgive you for good. He won't blackmail you. He won't extort you. No, he will forgive you. God is not a man. He is not a person. He is honorable. He will do what he says. Psalm 51.3 For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Verse 3 points out that only a person that admits his wrongs and takes responsibility for his sins can obtain mercy. If you are too big to admit your wrongs and imperfections, you will be invariably unworthy to be a recipient of mercy. Don't cover your sin. What's the point? God knew you would commit that sin even before you did it. Don't deceive yourself into hiding your sins. Confess them today. Psalm 51, 4-5 For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. 
Let's focus on this phrase for a minute. My sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. David's sin was always in front of him. Sin will haunt you. Sin will torment you. Sin will cloud your judgment. Sin will destroy you. Sin will break up your home. Sin will destroy your health. Sin will take your money away. Sin will rob you of your joy. Sin will put a wall between you and God. Sin will throw you into a hole deeper than you ever thought you could go. Sin unchecked will leave you in a place where you will wonder, how did I get here? I say all this because I have seen it firsthand with my own eyes. Sin does this to people. For sin to be such a small word but be such a big problem is mind-boggling. Three letters, S-I-N. How can three letters be the cause of so much destruction? Sin is such a big problem that the only person who could deal with it is God. Jesus had to come down to deal with sin. That should show you the magnitude of sin. We should not enter lightly into sin. Verse 4 and 5 presents the fact that we can only sin against God and none other. Although David had committed adultery and murder at the same time, yet he confessed that he had sinned only against God. This implies that the offenses we commit against our fellow humans are actually sins against God. However, we sin because we are sinners by default, born so from our mother's womb. This is the basis for our plea for mercy and cleansing, our frailty. Psalm 51, 6 through 9. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. From verse 6 through 9, we find that even when we desire righteousness, to act righteously is not within our reach. Therefore, we need to cling to God for him to wash us. For we know that if he cleanses us, we shall be pure and whole, and the souls which do sin may thenceforth rejoice in righteousness. If you notice from verse 10, the prayer pattern changes. In the first nine verses, he is focused on the removal on sin. Take a look. Verse 1, Have mercy on me, blot out my transgressions. Verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 9, Hide my face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Psalm 51.10 Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Then we reach verse 10, and then the plea for the creation and restoration begins. A clean heart is necessary to not continue in sin, and a right spirit will lead us in the path of righteousness. If God casts us away from his presence, to where would we resort? If he takes his Holy Spirit from us, only then are we doomed. Sin robs people of joy. Psalm 51, 13 through 17. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. In verse 13, we find that the joy of having obtained forgiveness and the mercy of God becomes the catalyst that will then aid us to teach other erring sinners the ways of the Lord. Having received mercy, we can show transgressors the most excellent way, the cross. Verse 14 through 17 describes that only when we have gained full deliverance from our sins can our tongues sing of God's righteousness. Only then can our mouths sing his praise. God is not moved by the sacrifices and burnt offerings of sinners. All he desires from men is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. God is not looking for perfect people per se. He's looking for people who will surrender their weaknesses to him. 2 Corinthians 1-3 through Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. 
The concluding verse of Psalm 51 reflects the cry of protection from sin. This is a stern warning for us about this subject. Believers are not expected to sin deliberately, hoping to confess their sins later to get rid of their guilt. The forgiveness of God does not give us the license to sin willfully. Acts 17.30 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Any believer who sins willfully is taking God's grace for granted and will incur God's wrath upon his or her life. However, a spiritual bath is necessary when we ignorantly or out of our weaknesses and imperfections transgress against God's laws.